If you became obsessed with a serial killer butchering subway commuters, what would you do? There's something strange going on down in the New York City underground. People board trains and are never seen or heard from again. Day in and day out, year after year. It's almost systemic. When a rogue photographer desperate for the gruesome shot that'll launch his career encounters a dark hulking figure who might be a serial killer, he'll disappear so far down the rabbit hole, he'll almost leave Earth completely. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the butcher in the midnight meat train. This bald picked the wrong night to work late. He wakes on the New York Green Line subway to find the train is completely deserted, or so it appears. Someone call his doctor, cause he seems unable to tilt his eyes or head down. He misses the massive slick of human viscera under his feet and slams onto his back in the spill. I think someone got motor oil in my blood supply. He slips and slides like a newborn horse before heaving to his feet. Instead of scrambling to the back of the train and working to open that back door, he starts walking toward the source of the blood. Through the windows in the next car, he can see a butcher bludgeoning another person to death with a mallet. He can't quite decide if this is just your normal city murder or something more. Across town, Leon the professional photographer mopes home to his leagues out of his league girlfriend Maya, where she springs some stellar news on him. She's gotten him a once in a lifetime meeting with one of New York's make or break art gallery owners Susan Hoff. What interests you? City. Well, that's my dream. Then you're failing. She calls his life's work melodrama, arresting but empty. She tells him to dip his nuts in the muck and stay for the real fireworks show next time, then come back to her with better work. Leon gets right to it, wandering the city streets in the dead of night, searching for his next subject. He descends into the hive of villain and scum known as the New York subway system, just in time to luck into his first crime. Three punks are hassling a woman on the steps to the platform. Hey! Here it is, the crucible in which all great sociopathic artists are born. Do you keep shooting or do you intervene? Leon calls out to the punks, baiting the leader to confront him up the stairs. The punk stalks forward and Leon keeps taking pictures. The balls on this guy, admirable if they weren't about to put him in a world of hurt. The bluff scares off the goons and the girl walks away unscathed, at least until she boards the green line and the butcher final destinations her anyway. At least it was instant. Nerds, you know the saying, the best defense is a strong offense? That's not exactly true when dealing with the hordes. When outnumbered by the swarm, the best offense is a strong defense. Harness that primal desire to man the walls by downloading this video sponsor, Rush Royale. Collect units like archers, trappers, bruisers, and blade dancers. Assemble a deck of these units for base defense. Devise a strategy around your deck's strengths and select a hero to use their powerful abilities to obliterate the forces of evil. You might recognize one of these heroes as Jake Paul. That's right, social media icon Jake Paul will be leading your armies at the front. Jake Paul is manning the wall, the thin barrier holding back annihilation with his signature super punch, hype, energy boost, memory photo, and champion's belt abilities. This ain't Insta or some punk boxing ring. This is mobile gaming. These little disposable units have digital lives and families. You gonna let them die? Or are you gonna defend the damn tower? I feel like this is turning into a David Goggins video. Who's gonna defend the tower? Are you? Install Rush Royale for free using my link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen to get the special master chest bonus with a gold set of cards and magic dust, which can be exchanged for legendary card. If you're using an iOS device, don't forget to allow tracking on the first launch of the game to get the chest. Hurry up, the number of rewards is limited. Bonuses arrives within a day after downloading with my link. The next morning, an article in the newspaper reveals the woman disappeared after Leon last saw her. Leon goes to the police with his photos and the cop is rightfully suspicious of a dude carrying around photos of an assault victim who just happened to go missing. Turns out the woman was a famous model and the cop wonders how he just so happened to be taking photos of her when she was attacked. Leon tells her to look at the surveillance tape. 
that she'll see everything, including the model boarding the train and him not following her, which is absolutely correct. But this is a great example of why talking to the cops is like playing with Greek fire. He jumbles his words and twists events within seconds of trying to explain what happened to her. It's so bad, even I think he did something to her. Leon goes back to Susan Hoff, who offers him a spot in one of her shows, plus a guest appearance in her bed, if he can bring her two more photographs as strong as the subway attack. It's like throwing gasoline on a bonfire. Meanwhile, down in the subway, a toxic threesome are talking about nothing when the woman notices that the train isn't slowing down for the next stop. When the green line passes into the wrong subway tunnel, the butcher approaches without fanfare and obliterates her husband's head. He hits with such force, it pops the eyes out of his head and paints his friends red with blood and brains. The butcher hooks the second man through the groin as the woman slips in her husband's guts. She tries to crawl away. The other guy tries to save her, but she can't gain purchase on the slick floors. She turns over and... <laughs> Who needs 3D with shots like these? You gotta admire that efficiency. In a scenario like this, a random act of violence committed by someone with two or three times your body mass and two deadly weapons, we should all hope it'd be over this quickly. My strategies here are moot for the moment because none of these people had enough prep time to even improv an escape attempt. But let's assume we're quick on our feet. If you can stay standing, you basically have three options, but none of them guarantee survival. Many, but not all, all New York subway cars operate in both directions on the tracks with conductor cars at both ends. The first and closest option would be to enter the conductor car at this end of the train and try to reverse it from here while an armed man the size of an orca breaks down the door. You would have to completely stop the train before reversing it back down the tunnel. Even if that's possible, the conductor at the other end of the train knows the train much better than you do. The second option would be to lock yourself in this rear conductor cabin, open the door and fling yourself out onto the tracks. While the train is careening down unmaintained subway tracks in the dark, even if you survive, walking, let alone running for help, may be impossible. The second version of this second option requires you to hit the dead man switch located in every conductor's cabin. This will bring the train to a halt and let you escape down the tracks. But of course, you'll still be pursued by the linebacker from hell. Still, it's better than pancaking yourself or letting him get his hooks into you. Finally, if you're not able to reach this conductor's cabin, then the last option would be to rush forward down the train to the conductor's room and incapacitate him before the juggernaut catches up to you, at which point you could attempt to reverse or stop the train before he tears a hole exactly your shape and size through the door. Unfortunately, a little later, we'll find out why this isn't an option at all. Surviving this attack is all but impossible once we fall and start mud wrestling in blood. There's only limited handholds down this car, and the most useful of these are the ones under the seats facing forward and backward. Grabbing one of these will give us a chance to grab a seat and drunkenly stumble to our feet, but now slicked in blood, we have to fight off the mountain or run the length of the train and fight whoever's running the murder express. Overhead, Leon's staking out the subway entrance for new subjects. When the butcher emerges, Leon's Peter Parker sends tingles, and he follows the giant man loudly. He turns the corner, and the butcher's waiting for him. Leon tries to play it off cool, but the butcher catches him and studies his face, before letting him go and entering the Hotel Barkley. Mass murderers aside, you got off super light here. Have you never watched a crime movie? You're not supposed to tail someone by riding their ass down the sidewalk. Stay back, peek around the corner instead of just walking around it like you own this city. Now, he scanned your face like a Terminator and your element of surprise is nuked. Later, Leon processes photographs and notices the butcher's unique sunburst ring in the last photo he took of the missing model before she boarded the train. Leon doesn't know when to quit and begins stalking the butcher through the back alleys of Manhattan. Sure, because that worked out so well the last time. He discovers the butcher works at an actual meat packing plant by day, and by night, he people watches from a platform bench until his Green Line train pulls into the station. Leon the idiot goes to follow him onto an empty train car when a cop stops to search his camera, saving his parasitic life. Meanwhile, on the butcher's train, it's slim pickings for the evening, just your average boxing champion turned knife enthusiast, and expendable in the making. The butcher slams the guy's head into the window, but he 
struck by some sort of illness that makes him cough up blood, giving his victim a momentary upper hand. The guy pulls a knife, only to get it sliced back into his shoulder a second later. He gets the butcher into a headlock, but can't quite seal the deal before the conductor steps out and puts one through his eye. Looks like the big guy's losing his touch. That's good news for us, or is it? Deeper down the rabbit hole, Leon infiltrates the meat packing plant in search of his white whale. And just like Moby Dick, the butcher ain't exactly hiding. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's hard to keep snapping exploitive pictures if you're dead, Leon. The butcher chases him into cold storage. Leon pulls the old feet up in the bathroom stall trick to avoid detection, but it doesn't work. Leon bolts, leaving a trail of carnage in his wake before hopping a ride out of there. Maya comes home to find Leon has gone full Charlie Day. You never go full Charlie Day. Photos of the butcher litter the ground, and he's even color-coded a missing persons map of the city on the wall. These pins represent missing people for the last three years. Okay, not one of them has ever turned up. Those are rookie numbers for New York City, Leon. He tries to drag Maya into his conspiracy about the butcher until he starts pulling out news articles from over 100 years ago. Maya begs him to stop following sketchy randos into the death traps around the city, but it's already too late. Looks like you got your first killer fan. And I say it's time to bounce. Time to spring a sudden vacation on Maya, leaving to night on the first red eye out of the butcher's territory. Crimes happen in Hawaii too. Go film a murder in paradise. Instead, dip follows the butcher onto the god subway. I wish I could say you were too smart for this, but this is really on brand for you. The butcher kills the last two kids on his car, and out comes Leon's camera. Give it a couple minutes, and maybe the butcher can snap a death pic of you too. Really pull the whole collection together. Leon watches as the butcher strips and begins processing the bodies, pulling teeth, shaving hair, removing fingernails, and popping eyeballs out, all before hanging the meat to dry. The butcher smiles at Leon, who barrels down the length of the train. Maybe try closing any door behind you. Better yet, he should have run ahead and ducked into one of the small cubbies between the train cars. Here, he could have waited for the behemoth to rush through, wrap a chain around his neck, and toss him off the train. Of course, it's risky. You might go with him, but it's better than being cornered by a man you know will bash your brains in. Leon makes it to the conductor's car, but no one's coming to his rescue. <laughs> Congratulations, you died. I can already hear the Reaper slapping the back of your head. Oh, but Leon's not dead. It's so much worse. Leon wakes up hung from the ceiling in a still darkened train car at the end of the line. Creatures board the train and rake their claws across his body until he passes out. He comes to in an abandoned train station under the meat packing plant. At home, Leon undresses to find his chest has been marked with a strange symbol. He tells Maya everything that he saw and that he has photographic evidence of the butcher's work that was taken from him. But when she tries to call an ambulance, he knocks the phone from her hand and terrorizes her. Maya, I know this is harsh, but maybe it's time to go stay at your mom's for a while. At least until you can find a shrink willing to make house calls. Unfortunately, she's a good girlfriend, which means she's gonna do this stupid thing that gets other people killed. Because Leon warns her the cops will think he's responsible for the model's death, she doesn't go to the police. Instead, Instead, she recruits their friend, Jurgis. Seriously, Jurgis? To break into the Barkley Hotel with her to search for Leon's camera in the butcher's apartment. How about... No. Leon told you this guy is a serial killer. Not just your average violent one-time murderer, but a methodical, meticulous monster of men. Did you bring a weapon? Do you have 911 on speed dial? You don't even know if the camera's there. You'd have better luck calling the cops and saying you heard a violent screaming from his apartment rather than doing this sh And then she ambles. She f strolls through the butcher's apartment like she knows he won't be back for hours. You don't even know if he lives alone. If, if you're going to do something this monumentally stupid, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is have two friends helping you. The first is your lookout at the door and the first person in the room if they hear you struggling. The other friend is going to tail the butcher and text updates of his location every minute until you're out and clear. And we're not here to admire someone's saw collection or searching efficiently and getting out in less than 10 minutes. Max. Nope. 
footing around. Sneak quietly to confirm the apartment's empty. Then start with the furthest room from your exit and open every cupboard and drawer before closing them all again before you move on to the next. In the kitchen, Jurgis jump scares her. He wants to speed up the search by having both of them look, but he goes just as slowly as she does. And now, no one's watching the front door. The silent killer enters the apartment without either noticing. Jurgis has just found Leon's camera when the butcher caves his head in. Jurgis, you never stood a chance. Not much you can do when a ninja sneaks up behind you. Maya enters the living room to find the butcher's case sitting on the table. She pockets a leather folio of 100-year-old train timetables before she goes looking for Jurgis and realizes the hulking thing in the closet ain't him. She raises out of the hotel and ends up talking to the same police officer Leon once visited after breaking and entering someone else's apartment. I feel like this would go very differently for anyone not the color of buttermilk. The police officer says they checked out the butcher's apartment but couldn't locate Jurgis anywhere. She asks for the property Maya stole, saying that no charges will be filed and Maya pulls a pretty smart move considering all the dumb she's done. She tells the cop that Jurgis has the leather bundle. If they want it, they'll have to find him. Curiously, the cop doesn't even hint at believing her, which is a pretty big red flag. She believes you and your friend broke into an apartment and that you openly admitted it to a police officer, but she won't believe your missing friend has the leather folio. Sounds like she already knows what happened to Jurgis and knows what he did and didn't have on his smashed up body. Maya panics and goes goes to the diner where she works to steal her boss's six-shooter, not even bothering to check if it's loaded or not before she leaves. But when she steps outside to call Leon, the cop has followed her. A huge red flag. You just made it here, Maya, which means she was practically stepping on your shoes the whole way over here. Maya demands answers at gunpoint, but this cop is way too chill about giving cryptic answers. Yet another red flag. She tells Maya Jurgis is on the train at 14th Street. Street, the one arriving just after 2 a.m. Thank you for that incredibly specific, ominous information. Maya leaps away like a dog after a bone, but uh, just no. Aside from those 17 red flags she just blazed past, Maya saw the butcher's timetables. She knows that trains equal butcher, which equal getting butchered. And this cop's absolute indifference to the gun at point blank range tells us she thinks she has the upper hand here. The last last place we're going is on that train. I'd choose Arkham Asylum on escape day before I'd get on that car. But of course, Maya's the first to buy a ticket. At the meatpacking plant, Leon builds his butcher uniform from knives and hooks and a chainmail apron before he descends into the abandoned train station. I mean, personally, I would have probably stopped by Ace Hardware for the pieces to make a flamethrower. Maybe a gun shop for some Kevlar and a couple Glocks, since semi-automatic rifles aren't really legal in New York. I'm also heading to a sporting goods store, but we'll get back to that in a minute. As the train barrels past, Leon sees Maya on board. He races alongside the train and leaps onto the last car. <laughs> I mean, no, he didn't, obviously. At top, top speed, a subway train can go 90 miles or 140 kilometers per hour. Even at its normal pace of 55 miles per hour, Usain Bolt wouldn't be able to catch it. But sure, maybe the power of love turned him into the flash for a few seconds. Maya comes to a car with a window slathered in fresh ketchup. Instead of using her eyes to glance past the blood and see the dead bodies before entering the car, she walks walks in to find eight corpses dangling from the ceiling. You know, you don't have to be in here, right? She wanders deeper into the death room than anyone this freaked out actually would and finds Jurgis still alive, dangling from hooks inserted through the heels of his feet. <laughs> Even I felt that. Leave him be, Maya. You got bigger fish to fry. The butcher hears Jurgis writhing in pain and enters the car ready to kill. Maya grabs her gun and fires with her eyes closed, <laughs> missing him by a mile. She tries to run and takes a mallet to her leg for the effort. Leon calls out, drawing the butcher's attention away. How about you grab that gun and shoot him from behind while he's distracted by Maya? No, I guess Leon's just gonna have to fight a guy twice his size 
then. Maya tries firing again, but she has the aim of someone who's never fired a pistol before or used their eyes before. One of them hits the open door button, and the butcher beats Leon to the floor, stabbing through his forearm before Leon reaches for that arsenal of knives he brought with him and gains the upper hand. Unfortunately, Jurgis is butchered in the process. Leon gets the butcher against the ropes, hanging half out of the open car doors, and finally mallets him out of the train. This right here is why I would have stopped at a sporting goods store before I got here, for some good old-fashioned mace or bear spray. You know what'll give you a leg up in any fight, no matter what your opponent's size? Blinding them, blasting them with so much canned Bernie juice that their eyes melt in their sockets. Blinding the butcher will turn him into a wild, swinging, scared animal, but one that isn't going to grab you before you pick up that gun and shoot him at point-blank range, or kick him out of the open car doors. It's just too bad the butcher isn't the final boss. The train reaches the end of the line. The emergency lighting kicks in as a bunch of somethings gargle in the dark outside. The conductor steps out. Please, step away from the meat. Yeah, let me do that. Is there room in that conductor's booth for three? Or as sewer aliens enter the train to feast, Leon and Maya emerge into City Hall Station, which has been reduced to a pit of bones and blood. Suddenly, the butcher appears. Using bone shivs and blades, they slice and dice each other across the pit until Leon sees the symbol on his own chest etched onto the butcher too. I guess this is one of those last man standing kind of cults. Leon hulks out and beats the butcher down before ending the fight by slamming a femur dagger through the butcher's neck and burrowing a knife in his head. He didn't have what it takes anymore. He knew it must be done. It was a privilege. Welcome. The first rule of Butcher Club is, you don't talk about Butcher Club. The conductor tells him people have been feeding these things since the dawn of humanity to preserve order and keep the aliens from rising. He walks over to Maya and rips out her still beating heart. We are back at the beginning with Baldi. Leon's found a new calling, feeding the aliens that lie below. I'd love to tell you that the obvious way to beat these villains is to stop stalking the Butcher and go cold turkey on using the sub way ever again. It's definitely true that Leon, Maya, and Jurgis would still be alive, and mostly human, if Leon had minded his own damn business. But ultimately, Leon only encountered the Butcher once before the killer took notice of him, and by the time Leon had actual proof the guy was killing people, the aliens were ready to mark their next familiar. The problem isn't that the Butcher's big or deadly, or that the train is contained and almost inescapable. It's that this millennia-old system of feeding the creatures in the subway has layers and layers of failsafes. For it to function that long, it means this cult of alien feeders has people planted in the Metropolitan Transport Authority, working in the stations, and operating as police officers to close missing persons cases without question. There's no cameras or emergency levers on the train. There's no inspections of the derelict tunnels used to feed the creatures. Even if you killed the butcher and the conductor, you are walking out of a tunnel system full of ravenous beasts into a city full of bloated bureaucrats ready to go through every fingerprint on that subway car to figure out who you are. And this isn't just happening in New York City, a shiny village that's barely 400 years old. It's happening all over the world, meaning your life is never truly your own after this. Not without major plastic surgery and never letting your blood enter into any public biological record for the rest of your life because they will find you. The only way to truly beat this system is to dismantle it from the ground up which is only possible from within, after you've seen the Butcher kill and know who he's killing for. Which means we're gonna need a sequel. For all those reasons, I think the Midnight Meat Train remains unbeaten. And remember, our alien overlords are probably already here. 